why don't you commit yourself to the Lord and let the Lord speak to you today that you will not miss whatever he wants to teach, whatever he wants to say. I can't hear you pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our workers' training tonight. Thank you for your goodness upon every life. Thank you because you brought us here for a purpose. And that purpose in your heart for everyone without exception will be fulfilled in Jesus' name. Once again, open your word to everyone tonight. We we'll pray, Lord, you will challenge every one of us and help us to have better, deeper understanding of your word tonight. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. I was waiting for a better amen. amen. God bless you. You can sit down. We're coming to Romans chapter 12. And I'm reading from verse 1. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be thou transformed, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that she may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man, that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Tonight, we're looking at the word of God on abiding grace for acceptable service. Abiding grace for acceptable service. It's a great privilege to be called to the service of God in the church, as well as in the world. We're not only serving God in the church, we're also serving God in the world. Our service is both in the church and in the world. Our calling is by grace and can only be fulfilled by grace. You remember that scripture that says, by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. We can say the same thing for sanctification. By grace are you sanctified through faith and that not of yourselves. Can't we say the same thing for healing? By grace are you healed through faith and that not of yourself. And as we're called into the ministry, we can also say by grace are you called to service through faith and that not of yourselves. It's simply saying that a call to the ministry is not by marriage. It's not by, you know, who I am, what I've done, and my grandparents or my parents. It's just by the grace of God. And we need to abide in that grace so that our service will be acceptable unto the Lord. We cannot live the expected life as saved souls, as sanctified souls, without the grace of God. The carnal mind cannot please God without him, that is, without God, without his strength, without his power, without his grace, and without his mercy, we can do nothing. Human strength, human training, human skill cannot serve God acceptably, cannot serve God positively, cannot serve God productively, cannot serve God rewardably. Defilement must be cleansed at salvation. Depravity must be crucified and put to death at sanctification. The grace of God must keep working in our hearts to help us walk for God, the God of all grace. We're looking at uh, Romans uh, again, chapter 12. And in Romans chapter 12, it tells us in verse 3, for I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that's among you, that is all of us who are here, all of us who are listening and getting the training together tonight, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. That is not to think 
already I know everything. Already I can do whatever. And what, whatever it wants me to do, I can do. No, don't think like that. We need the grace of God. We need the mercy of God. None of us can be independent of God. As we're serving God, he says, without me, ye can do nothing. That's why it says, which you think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Hey, look at Paul the Apostle. Look at his testimony in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Think about his life. He got forgiveness only by grace. Because that man, you know what he had done? And you know how far he had gone? In evil, in wickedness, before he was saved. But by the grace of God, I am saved. I am what I am. And in sanctification, by the grace of God, thank God I'm sanctified. I'm what I am by the grace of God. And then he gave me the ministry of the apostle. He has given you the ministry of a pastor. He has given you the ministry of a worker. He has given you the ministry of a minister. And you are what you are by the grace of God. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. The grace of God will not be in vain in your life. But I labored how? I said he labored how? more abundantly than they all and yet there's no room for pride that i've done this i've done this i've done that we cannot be proud because it says even though i labored more abundantly than they all yet not i but what the grace of god which was with me we're not uh, allowed to look down on anybody we're not allowed to belittle anybody. We're not allowed to uh, make ourselves so great and say, see what I've done, see where I've gone, see what I've achieved. Because of what I've done, I'm greater than so-and-so. I'm higher than so-and-so. It says no. Because everything I did was not in my own strength, not in my own power. It says I am what I am by the grace of God. And the Lord wants us to ask for more grace. And the grace will work more effectively in your life in Jesus' name. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Here we're reading from verse 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. It says, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you. Whatever he has called you to do, God is able to make you who you ought to be. No matter what mountain he wants you to climb, God is able to make you climb that mountain. And no matter how rough the way, he will give you the strength. You say, I'm not strong, he'll give you strength. I'm not courageous, he'll give you courage. I say, okay, I'm not as capable as that other person. He'll give you all the capacity, all the skill you need, he'll give you in Jesus' name. I thought you'll say, Amen. And God is able. Say, my God is able. You will not fail. I said you will not fail. You will not be tired. God is able to strengthen you. And he will strengthen you in Jesus' name. Look at this. God is able to make all grace. How many kinds of grace? All grace abound toward who? Thank God I'm having more grace today. I said I'm having more grace today. Higher grace in your life. Greater grace in your life. Abundant grace in your life. Sustaining grace in your life in Jesus' name. Because our God is able. I'm going to say this way. Your God is able. To make all grace abound toward you. That ye. Tell me the next word. Always. Tell me again. Having. Tell me what follows. In how many things. Did you mark that reverence to your Bible? And then every time you get, you get tired, go back to that verse of Scripture and read it over and over and over until abundant grace flows into your life. Because God is able to make all grace abound toward you that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound unto every good work. That, that verse was written because of you. It was written because of me. And I'm going to make the best use of that in my own ministry, in my own life. And you'll make the best use of that in your ministry, your life in Jesus' name. 
We're coming to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. We're looking at verse 28. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. It says, Wherefore, we receive in a kingdom that cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. It says, We can come to God. And we can come to God. We don't only really come to God for salvation when we think of grace. Yes, we do. And then for sanctification when we're thinking of grace. But it says for service. We therefore, wherefore, we receive in a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably. You will serve God acceptably. You will not serve in vain. He will reward your service. Here in this life, he'll reward you. And then in the great beyond, he'll reward your service in Jesus' name. Abiding grace for acceptable service. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, hindrances and obstacles to acceptable service. Hindrances and obstacles to acceptable service. You see, there are things that hinder our service to the Lord, and we need to know what they are, so that by the grace of God, we will avoid them. And all the pitfalls and all the dangers in the way of serving the Lord, the Lord will make you overcome. Number two, holiness and obedience in an aberrant society. Aberrant society. Now you are going to pardon me. You understand that we are talking to many people. And some people, the word aberrant may not be very familiar with them. I know that those of you who are here, you know the word and it's all right for you. But you know, I need to explain this for people out there who are hearing. The way we spell aberrant, A-B-E-R-R-A-N-T. You knew that. Aberrant society. Aberrant, it means to go astray, to fall away, or to go into areas that are not normal. As you look at our society, it's an aberrant society. As you look at our society, it's a society that has gone astray. As you look at our society, it's a society that has gone away from the norm, and they have gone away from righteousness, and they have gone away from the truth of the Lord. The society in which we live, the society in which we minister, it's an aberrant society, a society that has gone astray, a society that is not following the will of God. And yet we're called to holiness in such a society. And we're called to obedience in such a society. Point number two, holiness and obedience in an aberrant society. Number three now, humility with orthodoxy. Orthodoxy means you, you're following the real word of God, the standard of the word of God. You're following the entirety, the completeness of the word of God. Orthodoxy. You're not into false doctrine. You're not into mutilated study of the word of God. And you're not into a kind of defiled, deranged the word of God, falsifying the word of God. You are orthodox in your belief. Orthodox in your understanding. Orthodox in your interpretation. Orthodox in your belief of the truth. Humility with orthodoxy among appointed servants. Tell me your number one there. Hindrances and obstacles to acceptable service. You see, if our service is going to be acceptable, we need to understand the hindrances to avoid. We need to understand the obstacles to avoid. We're looking at Leviticus chapter 22. Leviticus chapter 22. And I'm reading here from verse 20. Leviticus chapter 22, reading from verse 20. It tells us here in verse 20. It says uh, in verse uh, 20, it says, But whatsoever has a blemish, that shall ye not offer. For it shall not be acceptable for you. Look at that. It says, whatever you are going to offer to the Lord, your skill, your message, your ministry, your gifts, there must be no blemish. Because if it has blemish, 
it will not be acceptable in the sight of the Lord. Look at verse 21. And whosoever offers a sacrifice or peace offerings unto the Lord to accomplish his vow, or a free will offering in beasts or sheep, it shall be perfect. No spot, no sin, no blemish, no evil. It shall be perfect to be accepted. There shall be no blemish therein. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 6. Jeremiah chapter 6. And I'm reading from verses 16 and 17. As we're serving God and we're offering what we have unto God. For it to be acceptable service, look at this. Thus says the Lord, verse 16. Stand ye in the ways and see. And ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein. And ye shall find rest for your souls. What did they say? But they said, tell me out loud. These were people who wanted to serve God. And then the Lord said, as for the old ways. As for the right path. As for the way of righteousness and the way of holiness. And walk therein. They said, we're not going to walk therein. Look at verse 17 also. I set watchmen over you, saying, Hacken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, Tell me what they said. Oh, we're not hacking. We're not hacking. These were people that, religious people, and yet they said they were not going to hack into the word of the Lord. They were not going to listen to the teaching of the word of God. And they were not going to walk in the path of righteousness. Look at verse 20 then, as a result, it says, To what purpose cometh there to me incense from Sheba, and sweet cane from a far country, for your burnt offerings are not acceptable because they were not going to stand on the word of God and they were not going to live by the word of God and they were not going to keep the standard of the word of God in their lives. Then the Lord said, your sacrifices will not be acceptable to me nor your sacrifices sweet unto me. We're looking at uh, Hosea chapter 8. Hosea chapter 8 verse 3. For our service to be acceptable, it must mean that we are saved, it must mean that we are sanctified, and it must mean that we are free from defilement. Hosea chapter 8 verse 3, Israel has cast off the thing that is good, the enemy shall pursue him. Israel has cast off the thing that is good, what the Lord himself had given to them, the good doctrine of the word and the good ministry of the word, and the good pattern they ought to follow, they cast that off, and they said, was he going to be serving the Lord? Look at verse 8. Israel is swallowed up. Now shall they be among the Gentiles as a vessel wherein is no pleasure. A vessel wherein is no pleasure. That is, as they cast off the teaching of the word of God and the calling of the Lord upon them, it says now they'll be like vessels without honor, without pleasure. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 15. Proverbs chapter 15, I'm reading from verses 8 and 9. Proverbs chapter 15, verses 8 and 9. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord. If you are not born again, your service is abomination to the Lord. You may have some skills, some ability, you might have some training you've got in the world before you became a Christian or before you joined the church. But if there is sin in your life, it says the sacrifice or the ministry or the gift or whatever it is that that sinner is bringing because he has not repented, because he has not yielded his life to the Lord. And because he refuses to walk in the way of righteousness, whatever he does, it may be kind of uh, skillful, it might be appreciated by people, it might even benefit some people, but the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. But the prayer of the upright is delight. Look at verse 9. The way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord. 
the way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord. Proverbs chapter 21, I'm reading from verse 27. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 27. The sacrifice of the wicked, tell me. I can't hear you. Are you afraid because you are wicked? Verse 27, the sacrifice of the wicked, tell me out loud. It's abomination. How much more? How much more? When he brings it with a wicked mind, a wicked motive, a wicked intention, a wicked heart, a wicked reason, a wicked bragan, a wicked plan. He has a wicked plan. He has a wicked motive. He has a wicked a propensity within him. And then he's bringing a gift to the Lord. That service is abomination unto the Lord. And let's say this way. If you're going to say that, uh, you know, there's something that hinders or something you know, is um, an obstacle in the service of the Lord, we can put everything together in one word and say sin is an abomination to the Lord. Sin is what disqualifies us. Sin is what uh, disqualifies our service with the Lord. But I need to explain to you, because I've seen that many people, they have a limited understanding of what the Bible calls sin. And I can define it for you. I can, you know, go to the original language and then tell you that this is what it means. Or I could read some references to it that to say this is sin and this is sin. I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to do it another way. For you to understand what are hindrances and what are obstacles in the uh, service of the Lord in a acceptable service. I'm going to use uh, sin as S-I-N. And number one, it means Satan infested, infiltrated nature. Satan infiltrated nature. Or Satan infested nature. When Satan fills the heart of somebody with thoughts, with ideas, with plans, with action, and then with that heart, Satan infested nature it comes to offer anything to the lord it's not acceptable look at acts of the apostles chapter chapter 5 acts of the apostles chapter 5 i'm reading from verse 3 but peter said ananias why has satan filled thy heart to lie to the holy ghost why has satan influenced your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost. Why have you allowed Satan to infiltrate your heart? To lie to the Holy Ghost. Why have you allowed Satan to infest your heart? Saturate your heart. Fill your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost. You know, there are some uh, people, some workers, they say, after all, I'm all right because I didn't commit adultery. For them, the understanding is only adultery disqualifies a person from the work of God. They say, I, I thank God. You can ask any of those ladies. Ask any of those people. I don't commit fornication with anybody. Uh-huh. I hear you. And that means because he has not committed fornication, even if Satan has filled the heart, then that means that he can still keep on serving the Lord. By the way, Judas did not commit adultery, but Satan filled his heart. By the way, Achan did not commit adultery, but Satan filled the heart. By the way, all those people that went astray, Satan did not, uh, they did not commit adultery or fornication, but Satan infested and infiltrated their hearts. They became disqualified. Once you allow Satan, demons, evil spirits to fill your heart with something wrong, and then you allow that, you carry that out. Sin is Satan infested nature. Not only that, sin is secret, intense negativism. Secret, intense negativism. You see, there are people, they're negative to the church. They're negative to the ministry. They're negative to the progress of the children of God. They're negative to everything that we're doing. And it is intense. It is very serious in their heart. And 
it is secret. Nobody will know it, but you know, that scene, S-I-N, I'm looking at um, uh, this, uh, Second Samuel, Second Samuel chapter 13, uh, and I'm reading from verse 22. Second Samuel chapter 13, uh, we're looking at verse 22. It says in verse 22, and Absalom spake unto his brother Amnon, neither good nor bad. Absalom spoke to his brother Absalom, neither good nor bad. It was secret in his heart. Look at this in verse 22. For Absalom hated Amnon because he had forced his sister Taman. He had seen in his heart. It was secret, but it was intense. Intense hatred with negativism. Anything Amnon said, he was negative. He defiled my sister. Anything I'm not did, it, it was negative. Because look at him, look at him. If, uh, you know, he's singing negative in the heart towards the singer. If he's uh, teaching a certain scripture, it's negative in the heart. And he's negative to the core. And yet, Absalom did not commit adultery. But you know here, he had this intense and serious secret negativism. If you're like that in the church... If you're like that among the workers, you're not happy with us, you're not happy with the church, you're not happy with the plans in the church, you're not happy with the program of the church and the progress of the church. We say we're going to have crusade and then you say, what do they want? They want members, are this not enough? And you're very negative to the core. That is sin. Anything you're offering to the Lord is unacceptable because of S-I-N, secret, intense negativism. Number three, self-indulgent naughtiness. Self-indulgent naughtiness. You see, there are people, as you see them, they can recite the doctrines, one, two, three, four, five to 22, and they can tell you the interpretation of this, and any time we are saying that if you have any, any question, there are some good, reasonable questions. It's like the good, good members of the church, and the good workers in the church, but there's naughtiness, and it is self-indulgent naughtiness. That kind of naughtiness in the heart makes a person to live in sin. And whatever you are offering to the Lord, with all that self-indulgent naughtiness, means nothing to the Lord. That's the reason why we need to check up our hearts. How am I in the sight of the Lord? Because you see, all these, I didn't do this, I didn't do this, and that naughtiness is there. It disqualifies you in rendering real service unto the Lord. I'm looking at James chapter 1, verse 21. James chapter 1, and I'm reading from verse 21. In James chapter 1, verse 21, it says, Wherefore, lay aside, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. Superfluity of naughtiness. You're, you're recognized for being naughty. You're recognized for being stubborn. You're recognized for being disagreeable. You're recognized for, you know, this the way the church is going. You're recognized for wanting to go this other direction. You're living in sin. Naughtiness is sin. And that superfluity of naughtiness is sin in the sight of the Lord. And it disqualifies us from serving the Lord. That's why it says you lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. As we receive the word, the Lord will cleanse us. And the Lord will turn us around. And if you have any kind of, you know, that self-will, that, that's naughtiness, when you're all the time, I must have my way. All the time, this whole church, look around, all this multitude, they must bend to my opinion. They must bend to my idea. If they don't bend to my idea, I will scatter the church. That is sin in the sight of the Lord. But you know what sin is? S-I-N, society influenced norm. Society influenced norm. That means you seem to have a norm, but society has influenced that. You seem to have a principle, but it's a principle that society has influenced. You seem to have an idea, you know, I'm a man of principle. That's not enough. Who gave you the principle? 
Who gave you that norm? Because if it is society influence norm, you know what? It's a sin in the sight of God and it will disqualify you. It will disqualify your service. It will disqualify your offering. It will disqualify anything you try to offer unto the Lord. And I need to ask you, who are your advisors? Who are your counselors? You know, because there are people, you're walking in the church, and then somebody is uh, instigating you, and somebody is uh, influencing you, and a counselor is saying, why don't you do this and do this and do this? Why don't you deal with the church like this and deal with the church like that? That kind of society influence norm that you hold on to, whatever preaching you hear, and whatever conviction the Holy Ghost brings in your heart, that society influence norm is what you are holding to. I'm looking at Second Chronicles chapter 22. Second Chronicles chapter 22. And I'm reading from verse 3. Second Chronicles chapter 22, verse 3. It says in verse 3, He and also walked in the ways of the house of Ahab, for tell me ah uh, you are not opening your bible on which a page are you tell me which uh, what's the book second chronicles what's the chapter chapter 22 what's the verse oh we're on the same page and i can't hear you look at this he also walked in the ways of the house of ahab for his his mother was his counselor to do wickedly read that again for his father could be his counselor to do wickedly look at that for his children could be the counselor to do wickedly look at that again for his wife could be the counselor to do wickedly look at that again for the husband could be the counselor to do wickedly you see when you we, we preach the word of god anybody coming to deeper life will tell you that we go from book to book and chapter to chapter and yet why is the life not changed why is the life not better than what we see because there's an outside influence because there is uh, maybe a kind of society influence, and it says over here, his mother, or the father, or the wife, or the husband, or the children, or the neighbors, or the friends, will be counseling them. Do it this way. Do it this way. Say no. Don't accept that. When they say, we'll read from the word of God, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourself for the watch over your soul as they that must give account. Somebody comes to me and says, don't accept that. What are they not accepting? They don't want to accept the word of God. That's the word of God. If we don't accept that and we're being influenced from another angle and we have society influence norm, that means that you are living in sin and your sacrifice will not be acceptable unto the lord number one sin tell me satan infested nature number two tell me secret intense negativism number three tell me there self-indulgent naughtiness number four tell me Society influence norm number five slowly invading nominalism slowly invading nominalism nominalism is when we are like we're talking about the nominal church you see you know, that church is a nominal church they have the doctrine on paper you cannot see it in their lives and when in our church you are like that too that there is slowly invading nominalism that all the things we preach, we have them on paper. All the things we preach, we have them on record. All the things we preach, we have them on outlines. But we're no more obeying them. Salvation, we're no more obeying that. Repentance, we're no more obeying that. Righteousness is no more visible. Sanctification, holiness is no more visible. We know it in the hedge. We know it in our Bible. We know it as a doctrine. Where is that sanctification? And where is that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord? When slowly 
Nominalism is invading the church. That disqualifies us. We're looking at Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 1. Revelation chapter 3 verse 1. And unto the angel of the church is sent his right. This thing saith he that has the seven spirits of God. And the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, but an art dead. You have a name, that's nominalism. Deep alive, that's a name. Are we deep? Are we deeper? Are we deep in our understanding? Are we deep in our conviction? Are we deep in, our, in relationship? Number six, silent indifferent neutrality silent indifferent neutrality it's just that well i'm not opposed to it but i'm not in support you know, it's like you know we're too busy we're too active you know here crusade and their evangelism and this and that okay anybody who wants to go i'm not going to discourage them only that i'm not to get not going to get involved that is silent, indifferent neutrality. And people like that, they say, nobody can accuse me of stealing. Nobody can accuse me of adultery. Nobody can accuse me of fighting. Nobody can accuse me of violence. Nobody can accuse me of drunkenness. Nobody can accuse me of whatever because I'm just silently indifferent and uh, neutral. Let's look at Matthew. Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. Uh, I'm reading from verse 41. Matthew 25, uh, verse 41. Neutral. Neither up nor down. Neither left nor right. Neither bad nor good. I'm just neutral. Silent, indifferent, neutrality. We're looking at uh, Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for, tell me, prepared for the devil and his angel. <laughs> what did they do? These were terrible people. Did they commit adultery? Did they steal? Did they fight? Did they pull down the work of God? Look at this, for I was an hungered, and you gave me no meat, neutral. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink, just neutral. I was a stranger, and you took me not in, just neutral. Naked, and you clothed me not, just neutral. Sick, and in prison, and you visited me not, just neutral. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when so we thee an hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee, then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. Verse 46, 1, 2, 3, go everybody. They shall go into everlasting punishment. Why? Because of that kind of silent, indifferent neutrality. When good things are going on, you cannot be neutral. When evangelism is going on, you cannot be neutral. When we're spending our energy, our blood, our sweat and everything, and we're moving the church forward, you cannot be neutral. When we're building churches, you cannot be neutral. When we're doing evangelism crusade and everybody is saying, let's go. And then, you know, these uh, three days, we're going to comb the whole area and we're going to preach the word. In the name. You cannot be neutral. And when we're bringing converts into the kingdom and we're developing those converts and we're training them, discipling them, you cannot be neutral when we're giving water to the thirsty and food to the hungry and clothes to the naked. You cannot be hungry when we're contributing money to get something done for the kingdom of God. You must be actively participating because if you are neutral, it is sin. And it says, these shall go into everlasting punishment. I pray God will forgive the past, but then we'll rise up in newness of nature.
newness of consecration, a newness of commitment to the Lord in Jesus' name. Number seven, servants investing nothing. Servants investing nothing. Nothing, S-I-N. Servants, you were supposed to be servants of God. We're not even paying our tithes and offering. We're supposed to be servants of God. We're not even contributing what we have. We're supposed to be servants of God. We bear the title. And yet, we do not invest anything in the kingdom. Servants investing nothing. Look at Matthew chapter 25. I'm reading from verse 26. Matthew chapter 25. Reading from verse 26, his Lord answered and said unto him, The wicked and slothful servant, the newest that I reap where I sowed not, and gathered where I have not strode, thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming, I should have received mine own with usury, with interest. What had happened here is that the Lord gave talent to different people. And he gave this man one. And this man, you cannot accuse him of adultery, of fornication, of stealing, of fighting, or even divorcing his wife. You cannot accuse him of living in what people call open sin, only idleness. Only non-involvement. Only non-participation. Only, let them go. I'm going to, you know, relax today. Only, I want to have my own time. I don't want anybody to control my time. In the district, you know, they are carrying something now. In the group, they are carrying something now. I, I just want to, you know, lay myself back. Servants invest in nothing. They don't invest their time. They don't invest their money. They don't invest their skill. They don't invest anything. And it is seen. Look at the result. Verse 30. In verse 30, it tells us, And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of tears. I pray it will not happen to you. But must come out of sin. That, you know, silent nothingness. Not investing anything. Not giving anything, not being involved in anything. You have retired before you became even tired. And it says such people, judgment is going to be upon them. Hindrances and obstacles to acceptable service. We know that if we offer anything with blemish, it will not be accepted. If we offer anything with sin, it will not be accepted. Of course, adultery, that will not be accepted. Fornication, that will not be accepted. Fighting, that will not be accepted. Strive, anything you offer with strive will not be uh, accepted. Anything you offer with vainglory, with pride, will not be accepted. Beyond that, if there's Satan infested nature. Beyond that, if there's secret intense negativism. Beyond that, if there's self-indulgent naughtiness. Beyond that, if the society influence norm. Beyond that, if they're slowly invading nominalism. And also if there is silent indifferent neutrality. And if, it, if there is a, a, a servants investing nothing, it means that whatever we say we're trying to do is not recognized, it's not appreciated by the Lord. We'll come to point number two now. Point number two. Holiness and obedience in an aberrant society. Holiness and obedience in a society that has gone astray. A defiled society. An abnormal society. An unrighteous society. A society that is not given in to the standard of the word of God. And yet, that's where we live, and yet that's where we work. Those are the offices we go to. The world in which we live and work is a society that has gone astray, far away from every good moral standard. We all work in institutions. We all work in industries. We all work in establishments. We all work in corporations. 
and offices we're all working marketplaces where moral norms and expected work ethics no longer obtains no longer exist and yet we're there there's darkness there and we have to shine as light there's a rebellion there and yet we have to live righteous lives upright lives because of uh, that, we need to remember that while you are there, you're still serving the Lord. Look at what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. Matthew chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 13. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, it says, Ye are the salt of the earth, polluted earth, defiled earth. Uh, sinful uh, earth and it says she are the salt of the earth but if the salt sh shall have lost the savor where we shall it be salted it is then for good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men verse 14 ye are the light of the world say I'm the light of the world in your office there you're supposed to be the light you're not supposed to join the works of darkness you are not supposed to join the evil practices. You are to distinguish yourself. You are to be distinct and unique and very different. Because it says here the light of the world is city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel but on a candlestick. And it giveth light to all that are in the house. Verse 16, everybody one, two, three, go. Praise the Lord. It says in your office, let your light so shine. They are fraudulent, you will not be fraudulent. They are dishonest, you will not be dishonest. It says, let your light so shine. And it says, before men, before men, they will know that this one is different. Let your light so shine in your family. Maybe you come from a family, I'm not talking of husband and wife now, but maybe sometimes husband and wife, the wife may not know the Lord, and the husband may know the Lord. Let your light so shine. Or it may be the husband does not know the Lord, and the wife knows the Lord. Let your light so shine. You cannot say because, uh, you know, we're married already. You were married before you became born again. The woman is still in darkness, and you are in the light. Let the light so shine in the extended family. Let your light so shine. They're still worshiping idol. Let your light so shine. In the market, they're, they're contributing money to worship idol. That's because they're in darkness. And it says, let your light so shine before me. In the presence of those people, you say, no, I'm different. I'm born again. I'm a child of God. I'm the light of the world. I came here not to follow you people. I came here to convert you. I came here to show the light and to show the way. Let your light it's so shine. You are walking. Uh, nowadays, you have association of these workers, association of these workers, association of these workers. We don't join association of workers. But even though we don't join association of workers, there are people, you know their method, you know the way they do things in those associations. And then maybe you do the same thing, then you are not light. You are not light. It says all that they are doing in darkness you will not do. And I pray you will not do in Jesus' name. In our workplaces, that is, uh, in our offices, and where we came from, we're surrounded by corruption. We're surrounded by tardiness. Tardiness is, uh, you know, slowing down the work. That after all, if we finish the work now, and then there's no more work, then we lose our job. But if we keep on doing it little by little by little, tardiness, so that we still get our salary. And yet the work never finished. I was reading in the papers of somebody who dug a borehole for a village for 27 years. Think about that tardiness, tardiness. That slowly and slowly, he does a little today and he's got paid for that. He goes back home and then he does it another thing, another week, and then another month. And the thing is just so slow, you're wondering, uh, when is it going to be finished? And then there's fraud. We're surrounded by people who are fraudulent. There is is uh, untruthfulness all around us and there is bribery and corruption there's something they call kickbacks or we're not even they don't call it bribes anymore just kickbacks now you've done that 
Christians don't get involved with that because it says, let your light so shine before me that they may see your good works and then they'll glorify your Father which is in heaven. There's double dealing. Double dealing. People who do that, they understand. And there's dishonesty. There's some truthfulness. As children of God, anything we're doing should be above board. Anything we're doing should be pure, should be clear. And we don't support anything that has uh, any kind of shady deal in them. In the offices, there's bullying. Bullying means that you're like a bull. They just shout you down. You want to stand for something. Somebody comes and then intimidates you and says, why are you doing that? You, you cannot do that one here. This is not church. This is office. And they bully and bully you. And then you are cowered down. And you don't know what to do again, but you know what to do from now. You resist the devil. Even if that person has swallowed the devil, has swallowed the demon, you stand upright to them that you are a child of God and nobody will bully you to make you do evil. Am I talking to somebody there today? You will not do evil. No matter what they will do, no matter what they will say, and no matter the threats, they might threaten you that this will happen, that will happen, your time is not in their hand. Your destiny is not in their hand. You will do everything the Lord has called you to do. In that marketplace, you'll be courageous and bold in Jesus' name. There's cruelty in many of those places. There's coercion in many of those places. You know, send people to you, they coerce you. They threaten you. They intimidate you. They make you afraid. And they tell you that, you know, if you're going to carry Bible, 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 you carry it here, well, burn that Bible away from you. And you, you, you will smell more than pepper. And that's just talk. Well, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Babylon. Or like Daniel in Babylon. Nothing can touch your life. I said nothing can touch your life. You will not yield to their oppression. There's oppression in those places of work. There is harassment in those places of work. If you happen to be a lady, you know, it may be the boss or the manager or whoever, and they are, you know, they, and they don't talk, uh, you know, like uh, quietly. They talk up front. They call it harassment, you know, kind of harassment. I don't want to mention the word, but you will not succumb. I said you will not yield. And then there is cover up cover up in those places you know something bad has happened and then they're finding out you're surprised everybody is saying the same good thing and everybody is covering up Co those who do they cover up their sinners you will not be part of them in some places there's illegal transaction other places unethical shady behavior but it is in the deepest of darkness that the true light shines the brightest we're called to holiness in those places of work we're going to be holy i said we're going to be holy in those places of the work we're going to be honest in jesus name you want to be holy in a hostile world they're hostile they don't accept holiness as doctrine. They don't accept the life of righteousness. But you are called to holiness in an hostile world. We're called to honesty in a dishonest world. The world is dishonest. And yet we know that we're not to be part of them. You will be honest everywhere you go. They might put you down for some time. They might even slash your salary for some time. You don't have the love of money. And whatever you have, God will stretch it and make it enough for your family in Jesus' name. And then uh, we're going to keep purity in a putrefied world. The, the world is putrefied. But we as children of God, as we go to those places, we're going to remain pure. I'm saying you are going to remain pure. Where are you there? You'll be pure in Jesus' name. 
we're serving God in that office. We're serving God in that industry. We're serving God in that textile, um, textile industry. We're serving God in that uh, fishing uh, institution. We're serving God in that college. We're serving God anywhere we are. And we, that's the place we're supposed to show our holiness and integrity. We will be, we'll keep integrity in an intimidating world. In an intimidating world, you'll stand firm. You'll be like an integral, a number that stands firm like the rock of ages and nothing will push you down in Jesus' name. We'll have boldness in a bullying world. Boldness in a bullying world. Don't look down. When they bully on you, don't, don't, you know, don't avoid them when they bully on you. Don't take another place where you'll not meet the bully. Come straight. Confrontation. If he wants to shout, let him shout. And you stay there calm. And you stay there looking at the face of the man. And you stay there knowing what you are going to stand on. Knowing what you are going to do so that they don't shout you down. You will not be bullied into evil in Jesus' name. The world is a bullying world. And they, they try to do that so that you will not stand. So that your backbone will break. And then when you are crushed, you cannot stand anymore. But you will stand. I said you will stand. Why are we coming here for training if, uh, you know, they bully on us and then we're going to a hole somewhere and we go into, you know, a dungeon somewhere and then we're oppressed and we cannot stand firm, we cannot stand for righteousness. Thank God I will stand. I said, thank God I will stand. That's what he has called us. He called us to courage in a coercive world. They'll coerce you and they want you to do evil. But you know, you're light and you're going to shine. You're light and you're light. Nobody is going to cover that light. You, you were called to transparency in a treacherous world. Called to transparency in a treacherous world. God's grace is sufficient for us. God's grace is sufficient for me. I said God's grace is sufficient for me. Somebody there, I can't hear you. God's grace is sufficient for me. I will not perish with the perishing world. I said, I will not perish with the perishing world. That's what he called us to. He calls us to be different. We're going to be different. He calls us to be holy. We're going to be holy. No matter who accepts that holiness or rejects that holiness, anywhere we go, in our homes, in our offices, in our communities, in our villages, in our towns, anywhere we find ourselves, we we'll remain holy in Jesus' name. I'm looking at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 14. Philippians chapter 2, verse 14. It says, Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that she may be blameless. You see that? And harmless. The sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world. A crooked and perverse nation, and yet you are going to shine. A polluted nation, and yet you are going to shine. An up upside down nation, and yet you are going to be upright in Jesus' name. It tells us in verse 16, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 5. Ephesians chapter 6, and we're reading from verse 5. It says in verse 5, Servants, be obedient unto them that are your masters. You see the other workers in your place of work, they might, uh, you know, be conspiring together. They're going to manifest rebellion, disobedience, truancy, and whatever, and they're going to break the windows and the windscreens if, uh, you know, the leadership of that institution does not answer them. But you're not like that. You're not going to join them. They're throwing stones. You're not going to throw stones for them. It says, servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh. According to the flesh. It's talking about our office. 
It's talking about our working places. It's talking about our institutions. It's talking about anywhere we're earning our daily bread. And it says with fear and trembling in singleness of heart as unto Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ. You see that in that office, you're a servant of Christ. In that market, you're a servant of Christ. Anywhere you find yourself, you're a servant of Christ, and you're being the watch of God. And they may not understand, but you know that here I'm a worker, a Christian worker there. I'm a minister, a Christian minister there. I'm a person to project the light of the gospel, even in this place where I find myself. It says, not what I service as men pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart with good will, doing service as unto the Lord and not unto men. Look at verse 8. Knowing that whatsoever good any man doeth in that place of work, knowing that whatsoever good sin any man doeth in that office, no, no matter what it is, it says the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether it be good, whether it be bond or free, whether it be bond or free. And those of us who might be bosses and directors and leaders and ye masters, do the same things unto them. For bearing threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is their respect of persons with him. Uh, can we look up here for a moment? You know, sometimes for us as a church, I need to explain this. When you come to the church, it may be that you are a coordinator, you are a pastor, you are a group pastor. And then somebody in your office who is above you in the office, over here in the church, is under your leadership. And over here in the church, he is supposed to say, to give you respect and to give you honor because you're a pastor, because you're a preacher in the church. But after we leave the church, he, you go to the office. When you go to the office, the roles change. He is the boss. He is the director. He is the foreman. He is the one that is leading that whole organization. And now although you are coordinator or preacher of us here, you are under him over there. You will not say he will deal with you differently from the other workers. Because you understand now, you are to listen to him. You are to obey him. This one is in the office now and you give him the respect you'll not say uh -uh, but you know i'm your pastor one will go to church but you know i am this and that but you look for work and you got to work there and because you got to work there you must obey the word of god and you must not start a kind of a regime of rebellion in that place of work i pray god will give us the right humility I pray God will give us the right understanding. I pray God will give us obedience to the word of God in Jesus' name. We're coming to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 22. Colossians chapter 3, and we're looking at uh, verse 22. Colossians chapter 3, we're reading from verse 22. Servants, obey. How many, in how many things now? I can't hear my people. Obeying all things your masters according to the flesh. Do you know there are people who do not recognize the word of God anymore? Church, church, church. Because we're in the same church. Because, you know, we're brethren in the church. And because I'm even a leader over him in the church. Look up here. Sometimes uh, somebody has, uh, you know, started a school. And somebody is uh, doing that school, and he may be a member of the church, and is not a leader over you in the church. And you happen to be a leader, and he employed you. And because you're employed, you're working there. And he expects that this will be done, this will be done, this will be done. And for us to be able to give the right thing to the Ministry of Education, all teachers must comply with this. And this thing must come in at this particular time. But you happen to be a preacher in the church, a leader in the church, but a teacher over there, and now you are negligent. And now you are kind of in a stardiness. You, you never submit your work early. And if uh, a brother calls you and he says, uh, how about uh, work? 
I, really, I don't have chance yet. You, you know, yesterday, you are a member of the church now. Yesterday, we had, uh, you know, this three pastors meeting, we had this, we had this. But this is work and this is school. And we need to submit this at this time. Okay, I hope you are not angry. You are quoting Bible against him. No, he's not angry. He's just telling you to do your duty. And he says that in that place of work, you must comply with everything that is being done there so you'll be a real child of God. I pray things will change. Amen. I say things will change. Uh, look at that verse again. Colossians chapter 3, verse 22. Servants obey in how many things? In all things your masters, according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily. Put your life there. Put your heart there. You're supposed to, to do something in that company, in that factory, in that corporation, that place of work. Do it with all your heart heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance for ye serve the Lord Christ. I pray we'll comply with the word of God in Jesus' name. God's grace is sufficient for us. I say God's grace is sufficient for us. And we'll do what he has called us to do in Jesus' name. Titus, Titus chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 9. Titus chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 9. Titus chapter 2 verse 9. It says, Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in how many things? In all things, not answering again look at that not answering again you know there are people you're trying to correct something and say in a place of work here well you know according to our work ethics this must take place this must take place and without even allowing the director or the manager or whoever to finish uh, you say hey, but excuse me i'm a christian i know what i'm doing and nobody is going to call. The Holy Spirit is controlling me. Uh -uh, not in that place of work. The work ethics there you will follow. Not answering. Again, it tells us in verse 10, not purloining, not loitering, not roaming about, not wasting time, not killing time, like we say. Not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in how many things? In all things. Point number three now, humility with orthodoxy among appointed servants. The Lord has appointed us and he has given us work to do. And he wants us to be dependable. He wants us to be trustworthy. And he wants us to have humility and to be submissive in the house of God. It tells us in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, I read from verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife or being glory. Nothing be done through strife or being glory. This is in the house of God now. You're singing, no pride, no being glory, no ego, no trying to iron out something, no fighting back. It says, let nothing be done through strife of inglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The mind in Christ, let that be in you. I pray it will happen that way. I said it will happen that way. You know, God hates pride. Lucifer was a great angel. Pride came in and God showed his hatred against pride by casting it out of heaven. We're looking in at Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. We're reading from verse 16. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16. These six things does the Lord hate. Yea, seven, an abomination unto him. Verse 17, was the first thing there? Tell me out loud. A proud look. Because you see, it's from the heart. If the heart is proud, 
haughty, pompous, egoistic, and feeling I'm above everybody, I'm above control, I'm above direction, I'm above teaching. It will show on the face, the way they look. And the way they look down at you, even though you might be their pastor, you might be their leader, the way they will look is like, who do you think you are talking to? God hates that. And I pray that God will give every one of us a humble spirit in Jesus' name. It says in verse 17 there, uh, chapter 6 of Proverbs, chapter, verse 17, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and hearts that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. God hates that. Proverbs chapter 16. We're reading from verse 5. Proverbs chapter 16. We're reading from verse 5. It says in verse 5, Everyone that is proud in heart is abomination to the Lord. How many people? Tell me out loud. Everyone that is proud. And God is not going to be afraid of you if you are proud. You are an abomination unto the Lord. What's making you proud? What do you have? He wants us to be humble in the sight of the Lord. And to be obedient to the word he teaches us. He says everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though and join in hand, it shall not be unpunished. We're looking at verse 18. Verse 18. Pride goeth before destruction. And an haughty spirit before a fall. If there is pride... Judgment is going to come. Look at, look at an example. Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 16. We're reading from verse 49. Ezekiel chapter 16 verse 49. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. What's the first word there? Pride fullness of bread and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And they were, what? Haughty, that's still proud, and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. He hates pride. He judges pride. But if we're going to serve acceptably, Psalm 101, Psalm 101, reading from verse 5. In Psalm 101, verse 5, Who privily slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off. Look at that. Who privily slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off. Him that has an high look and a proud heart, Will I not suffer? Will I not permit? Will I not allow? Will I not uh, live with? Mine eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He that walketh in a perfect way, he shall serve me. He wants us to examine our hearts, examine our lives, examine our way of doing the things of God, the work of God, so that all those imperfections and all the pride and all the evil things, everything will go away. I will serve the Lord in righteousness and holiness in Jesus' name. Verse 7, he that walketh deceit shall not dwell within mine house. He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. As workers, as leaders, we need God's grace moment by moment. Just like the converts and the Christians need the grace of God. Grace for holiness, he'll give us. I said grace for holiness, he'll give us. Grace for humility, he'll give us. Grace to overcome every sin, every temptation, the Lord will give us in Jesus' name. And grace to overthrow self. 
himself is living on the throne, sitting on the throne, where Christ alone should sit, the grace to overthrow that self and bring our Lord and Savior there, he'll give to us in Jesus' name. Grace to walk with God and grace to walk for God. We'll receive more grace today. Receive sufficient grace today. And then as we receive that, we'll serve God acceptably in Jesus' name. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. We're reading from verse 16. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Let us therefore come, how? Boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Grace is available today, and God will grant us grace. Grace for humility, he'll grant unto us. Maybe I should be direct. He'll grant unto you. Yeah. Say, he'll grant unto me. Yeah. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. It says, wherefore, we receive in a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably. If we're going to serve God acceptably, we need this grace. Sufficient grace. Sustaining grace, sanctifying grace, the grace that is steadfast, steadfast grace. It says, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Hebrews chapter 13, Hebrews chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Verse 9 be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrine, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with what? With grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that are occupied therein. Look at verse 7. Remember them that have the rule over you, who are spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith reject what does it say whose faith follow constraining the edge the goal the purpose the reason of their conversation verse 17 obey them that have the rule over you there should be no rebellion in the church no opposition in the church no disagreeable spirit in the church no division in the church. No conflict in the church. The Lord wants us to manifest the grace. The grace of obedience. The grace of faithfulness. The grace of submission. And the grace of absolute surrender. In the church, in the place of work, in the family, anywhere we find ourselves. Obey them that have the rule over you. And submit yourselves. For they watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Grace is available today. I'll get more grace. I'll receive more grace. And the grace of God will be abundant in your life in Jesus' name. We'll stand up to pray now. Let's rise up as we pray together. Tell the Lord tonight everything we have heard. Everything we've learned, we're going to be, we're going to follow through with the word of God. He wants us to have more grace today. And he wants us to have the nature of Christ in us. Everything that is going to destroy our work for the Lord that will not make our service acceptable, he wants us to reject. God will give you abundant grace.